when I'm in the ring, I want to win. I don't possess maybe one of the greatest puncher, uh, but I'm there for 15 rounds, 10 rounds to fight every second of it. I fight for the public. I like to, I'm an entertainer. When I go in there, I like to entertain, I like to, everybody's gonna say Vito is a good fighter. Vito and Afermo look like someone out of central casting for tough guys. His craggy face, scar-tissued eyebrows, and flat nose instantly passed him off as a fighter, as these facial features showed the after-effects of his devil-may-care fighting style. One writer described him as, quote, His style is Neil Caveman. Pressure is his game. He simply lowers his head and charges and once inside, he rains blows with unrelenting fury. Vito Anafermo may as well have been named Rodney Dangerfield, as he received very little respect during his tenure as a fighter. Boxing pundits pointed at all of the qualities he lacked. He lacked power, speed, defense, and he cut so easily. But somehow, some way, he managed to win fights. He was boxing's marathon man outlasting opponents who seemingly had more tools at their disposal, adding the fact that he had a club bright foot and was handicapped with double vision, all of which makes his success in the ring all the more impressive. Antifermo came to the United States in 1969 at the age of 16, settling in Brooklyn, New York. He came from a family of farm workers and did not grow up poor, but his family had one bad season on the farm. This prompted Vito, his older brother and mother to come to the United States. We landed right here. And it was pretty rough for me. This is a pretty bad neighborhood and I couldn't speak English. So kids used to pick on me all the time. And it's getting into a lot of fights because of that. And one night we went to a block party and kids always picking on me all the time. There was this wise guy that really, you know, we got in. So we went to fight. So cops came and and took us and they, and this used to be a prison. And I thought they were taking me there. Instead, they took me in this place here, PAL. Upstairs is a gym, a boxing gym. And that's where I start boxing. He showed promise in the sport immediately and began to fight in church smokers on weekends. At 17 years old, he had won the sub novice division of the New York Golden Gloves. And Tupermo then set his sights on the 1972 Olympics. But when he was attending a professional show, some fighters pulled out of their scheduled bouts. Vito was in shape. And when the promoter asked if he could replace one of the fighters, Vito said yes. He was paid $75, which was what he made in a week at his current day job. His Olympic dreams ended that night, but a pro career began. Vito campaigned in the junior middleweight division and went undefeated in his first 17 bouts with one draw until he met fellow New Yorker Harold Weston. The bout would be stopped in the fifth round because of a cut, an omen of things to come in his career. I worked very hard for that fight, and Afermo said afterward, and I knew I was going to win the fight, and I was winning the fight. They stopped it because of the cuts. What's the sense to go on? I was going to quit. Vito would press on, however, and then score another upset against the undefeated John L. Sullivan before taking on the wily veteran Denny Moyer. He then entered contender status by decisioning the legendary Emil Griffith. Griffith had aged out of his prime, but Vito outpointed the legend rather easily, and Sofermo would win the European junior middleweight title from Eckhard Dag in Berlin, getting cut and later claiming that Dag was the hardest puncher he had ever faced. He then battled evenly with future junior middleweight champion Maurice Hope until Hope stopped him with only 12 seconds left in the 15th round. Vito's weaknesses were now laid bare for all of his future opponents. He cut easily, and he had trouble with southpaws. He also found it necessary to rise in weight, as the junior middleweight limit became too difficult to make. Entering the middleweight division, Vito didn't waste any time in taking on the most dangerous opponents as he faced the hard-hitting Cyclone Hart. Vito would describe Cyclone Hart as the scariest guy he ever fought. Hart is going heavily to the body now, and after 
Ramos shortens up with his right to the head. about the way you get cut. Yes, I... Uh, How are you going to do about it? It's high in the head, so I couldn't... It couldn't been with the punch. It had to be with the head. Oh, you think it was a punch? I, I know so it was with the head, because I felt. I mean, you could feel between the punch Tony and the Tony Carrione, your manager, is trying to tell me something. Tony? I mean, that's, the, that's the deep one over there, right up here. Uh-huh. No, but he gets, he gets cut a lot. Yeah. He then compiled a win streak, winning by comfortable margins over veterans like Benny Briscoe, his own friend Willie Klassen, and Mike Hallisey. It was the win over Briscoe that sealed Antifermo's status as a top contender. On June 30, 1979, Vita would face defending champion Hugo Coro, who sported a record of 47 wins against two losses. You're absolutely convinced you can beat him. He is a clever, skilled, experienced boxer. Definitely. We've seen him against uh, some good fighters, and he did beat them. Uh, but I think I got the right tools to beat him. What tools? Strength. I last longer, and I'm just as fast as him, or maybe even faster. He fought guys that slow, like Rodrigo Valdez. Well, you knock him out. Well, that I can't predict. If I could predict that, I could predict anything. If the knockout comes, it will come natural. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Vito was an underdog and fell behind as usual. But he finished strong and took the title on two of the three judges' scorecards. His dreams had come true. But Antifermo was seen as a lame duck champion because the number one contender was a fellow named Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Vito was tagged as a 4-1 to underdog, and few gave him a chance against Hagler. Hagler played it smart, circling the ring and playing Matador to Vito's bull. The strategy worked. He opened six cuts on Anafermo's face, which later needed 25 stitches to close. Vito's only strategy was to lure Hagler into a Brooklyn street fight, and by the late rounds, he got his wish. Thank you. 
Vito was open to a rematch, but instead would face another top contender in Alan Minter. A bloodbath was anticipated, as both fighters had bled profusely throughout their careers. Like always, Vito was slow to get going, but when he did, he was like a steamroller going downhill. Neither fighter bled, but most ringsiders thought Antifermo had pulled it out, but the judges ruled in favor of Alan Minter. The two would rematch three months later, but this time, Minter would dominate scoring an 8th round stoppage. Vito would lay off from the sport for 10 months, seemingly out of the fight game for good, until one of his neighbors, a plastic surgeon, convinced him that the tendency for him to cut in fights was due to his protruding orbital bones. Vito, you come to Chicago tonight, uh, I'm sure in your mind, uh, having to answer the question of where your boxing future is headed. Yeah, definitely. Well, I was, uh, after my last fight, I was thinking to quit until I met a, a doctor, uh, Gerald, Gerald Ackett uh, from Long Island. He told me that one of the problems that I had with, with my skin, it wasn't the skin, and it was the bone under the skin that was causing the problem. Uh, that's, you know, what he called this very permanent bone and sharp under the skin when you get hit. And when I was getting hit, uh, the bone itself from under the skin was splitting the skin. So what did he do to alleviate that? Yeah, so he, he, went, to, he went to file the bone down. So now uh, what I have, I can feel for myself, uh, a flat part of the bone over here, which before I, I had this bone sticking out, and it was like a sharp knife under the skin that it would hit and it would split. So I'm hoping that uh, everything will be all right. That's the doctor assured me, you know, and uh, that's where we are right now. Because of the surgery, Vito thought that his eyes would no longer cut so easily. The one steel chain antifermo now found out that his resilience was no longer at the level that it was. Aldana fights his way out of the clinch. Right hand by Aldana. Vito and Afermo went down to one knee. Berg splits them up. And Berg will give Antifermo an eight count because his right knee touched the canvas. And rightfully so. Vito went down from a punch, not a slip. Well, he doesn't give him the full eight. Antifermo, he has four different cuts on his head. Can I go sit in the audience cell? <laughs> And Stanley Berg is bathed in blood as well, as we can see. Antifermo bleeding from a cut on uh, two cuts on his right forehead, one in his hair. Aldana connected with an overhand right. Antifermo with a clean right cross as a counter halfway through the last round. Although Vito has been cut, they have not been a factor. He's been able to fight, and he has not been blinded by his cuts. Winner, unanimous decision, Vito Antifermo. Only two months later after the Aldana fight, Vito would face Marvin Hagler in a rematch. And this time, his face would be ripped to shreds. Hagler had finally rid himself of Vito the Mosquito, as he called him, while Vito claimed that the cut was caused by a headbutt. And Tefermo would retire after the bout, only to return three years later against limited opposition. Finally, in 1985, he would retire after being stopped by the up-and-coming Matthew Hilton.
But unlike most fighters, Vito would find success out of the ring. He would buy and later sell a restaurant, work as a stevedore on the New Jersey docks, but ultimately get some recognition as an actor, appearing in Goodfellas, The Godfather Part 3, and most notably in a supporting role in the popular HBO series The Sopranos. But he remains the classic example of an overachiever in boxing, an underdog who overcame superior talents on grit and determination alone. As one boxing writer put it, they should have packaged what Vito had and put it in stores for Valentine's Day because the fighter was all heart. See, because you can get up there and look pretty. If you're not going to throw no punch, what good is it? People are going to watch the fights. They want to see punch roll. And that's what I'm there for.